<laughs> okay, you have mentioned that it was your personal goal to make the best archive of a presidency in history. Do you feel you achieved that? I don't know. I mean, look, that's for other people to decide. I feel good about the work I did. You know, there's got to be a few keepers in the 1.9 million photographs I shot, right? <laughs> there's probably a lot of clunkers too, but, you know, I think there's a few good ones. You photographed heads of state, Princess Diana, Oprah, the Queen of England, Michael Jackson, the Lumineers, the list goes on. Who is left on your wish list of people to photograph? And is that, does your answer change if I say you could travel back in time? Yeah, I mean, it, if I could travel back in time, I'd say Abraham Lincoln. Um, you know, can't imagine the pressure that he was under um, during a very tumultuous time. So I'd have loved to have been a fly on the wall during the Lincoln administration. Uh, current day, um, what about Senator Mandela Barnes? So us Madisonians, I'm a transplant of five years, but I call myself that. We have such pride for where we live, so I think a lot of us want to know why Madison, and at what point did you choose to land here? Well, you know, I really love wearing my winter coat in September. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it was because of a, a family connection, and, um, m you know, my wife who put up with what I did for eight years, uh, said she wanted to move to Madison, and I said, okay. The funny thing was, is they wouldn't let me visit during the winter. Like, I visited a couple times, and it was like really nice. You know, and then, boy, I didn't realize how cold it was. Yeah, we ran into each other looking for the elusive snowy owl of, of Lake Monona. Or Monona, wasn't it? Yeah. I'll bundle that, we could barely see you. So, if you could ask, Trump's chief White House photographer, Shayla Craig, had one question, what would it be? There's an eight-year-old kid here. <laughs> but it would basically be WTF. <laughs> like, how could you stand it? No, I mean, I think that uh, the, 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 what's, what's disturbing to me is that it, it I don't know what went on, but it doesn't appear that she had the same kind of access that I did in terms of truly documenting for history. You know, everything was like a reality show. You didn't ever see, you know, real pictures that, that came out anyway. And you know, there should be pictures of him watching TV on January 6th, and there's not. And I think that's, uh, that's not good for history that there's not, a, you know, that's, that didn't get covered. That's the job of the White House photographer. I mean, usually when I show my Reagan pictures, I, I sometimes show more pictures. I showed pictures from Iran Contra. Not a, a good moment for Ronald Reagan, but it was important for me to be in the room when all that stuff was going on. That, that brings to mind a photo that you had just posted recently, I think, that was uh, the Situation Room. It was a photo of Trump and his aides around him, I believe, and you had pointed out that she was standing right in front of the screen they would have been looking at, which if you were standing there, you wouldn't be able to see the screen. So it seemed like a very set up shot. Yeah. Uh, so some people don't know uh, about photojournalism ethics, so I'll just fill them in a little bit. Basically, our rules are that we cannot manipulate a situation. Um, we are the fly on the wall. It, we don't want to be fake news, right? So we want it to look very, very natural by not uh, changing anything. So. With that said, I think that our own inherent biases influence, influence what we photograph and how. Photojournalism is a personal view of a moment, and I'm wondering if you, could, if you believe that one can truly be an unbiased photojournalist. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't call it biased. I mean, I would call it like we, we all look at things a little bit differently. Um, and, you know, there's, especially if you go through the pictures in this book, they're very unusual pictures in that the president's not in them. So I was kind of like always on the lookout for other things going on. Is, is that bias? No, that's not a bias. That's just like I was looking for different things. 
Uh, to me, it's all part of the presidency. And um, yes, you can, like what, I remember somebody was saying to me uh, one time after I had documented the Reagan administration, like, why didn't you shoot Nancy Reagan at a really low angle with a flash to make her look evil? And it's like, what? Like, why would you, that's not my, you know, that's not, that, that's not the job, you know, the, doc, the job is to document for history, not to inject your, that kind of personal viewpoint into your work. So, I don't know if that really answers your question, but that's the best I got. Should we take a question from the audience? Yeah, anybody have a question? Go ahead. What brings you joy? What's that? She asked, what brings me joy? Hmm. Uh, well, I gotta say my wife, because otherwise, you know, she's sitting in the audience. Uh, and, you know, when the Red Sox win a game. <laughs> Not this year. Uh, and I actually, you know, I think photography still brings me joy. I mean, I, I you know, I don't have a job now, I'm unemployed. Um, but I still photograph a lot, you know, I, I uh, don't do that many assignments, I do a few, but I'm, I'm photographing all the time. My granddaughter brings me joy, for sure. She's just the joy of, I think, both of our lives. Uh, and we, we, you know, she's not in Madison, but she's close. And I think we miss her every day when we don't see her. I'm surprised she didn't try to FaceTime me when I was on stage. <laughs> Anybody else? Quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Can you stand up? Were you in Cuba in 2016? Yes. I got the flight. He held up our flight. You did what? He held up our flight. Oh. <laughs> no, we weren't there. <laughs> so that, the, the picture where I'm looking at the, the back of the spare limousine, you see that Big crab, that's in uh, Cuba. Yeah. Well, which brings up an interesting point of, uh, you know, the I had top secret SEI clearance, and oftentimes there would be things like Cuba, where they had been working on opening diplomatic relations for a year. You know, the two guys, uh, uh, Ben Rhodes and Ricardo Zuniga, would go in, to Canada and meet with the Cubans. And then they'd come back to the White House, go to, and they'd report to Obama in the situation. Well, I was in all those meetings, but it was totally secret. They didn't want anybody, to, they didn't want it to leak out that they were doing this. This went on for a year. And I, like, I couldn't even tell my staff. Um, like, we'd, we'd upload the pictures to our server, and then I told the photo archivist, just say, this is a meeting on country X. And so for like, I don't know, four or five meetings over the course of the year, nobody knew what these meetings were about, because you know, you can't tell from the photos, but I, you know, I knew the substance of the meeting, so I had to keep all that stuff secret until finally, you know, it came to fruition. I, I should look this way, anybody have a question over here? Just stand up and, go ahead, I don't know, somebody over there, I can't really see. Or if you can't stand up, just yell really loud. What is your relationship with Obama now and how do you think it will continue in the future? She asked, what is my relationship with Obama now and how will it continue in the future? Um, yeah, I mean, I see him, uh, you know, when I lived in D.C. Uh, uh, for, a, what was it, like three years before we left D.C. after his presidency, you know, I'd see him I don't know, three or four times a year or something. And now I just probably see them on average maybe twice a year. Um, I'm trying to think, I've already seen them twice this year. Uh, so, you know, I, I consider, like, I, I think he considers me a friend. I mean, not the kind of friend that I get invited over to dinner, but I get invited to all the good parties, you know. Um, and, um, I, I, it, it, like for the portrait unveiling, I showed a couple of pictures. Like I was invited as a guest, and then about a week or two before the event, 
Biden's photographer invited me to basically shadow him for the day, and I called up the Obama office and I go, I'd rather do that than sit in the audience. You know, do you want, do you, I'll, and I'll let you use the photos. So that's kind of how that went. And so he was like, sort of like, telling Biden, like, yeah, Pete didn't want to sit in the audience, you know, he just wanted to take pictures. <laughs> um, how will it go in the future? I mean, look, as, as Patty knows, uh, I, pay, I play online words with friends with him every day, you know, so, you know, and he gets really pissed if I, if I beat him by, like, more than 100 points. As you'll see in your new book here, too, they played a whole lot of spades on Air Force One. It's their favorite game. Okay, back to you. Back to me, okay. Actually, I am going to, uh, I'm going to ask a question that one of my photographer friends, Sharon, where's Sharon? Sharon. <laughs> Sharon wants to know what you eat for breakfast. What, what? What do you eat for breakfast? What kind of a question is that? Sharon wants to know. Uh, well, this morning I had a honey bacon biscuit from Ancora. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, you know, I think I usually have cereal and fruit or uh, um, I can't quite make an omelet. So I ended up doing, I usually end up doing like an egg scramble. That's it. Okay, are you happy, Sharon? All right, photojournalists tend to carry primary and secondary trauma from witnessing events or other intense emotions as they process, or other people's intense emotions as they process trauma. I've heard some photojournalists compare it to PTSD. You've experienced plenty of traumatic experiences or other people's trauma going to New Time, Connecticut after the Sandy Hook shooting is one example. Do you think you carry some level of post-traumatic stress from what you've experienced and documented and how do you cope with it? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that it actually helps talking about it and um, you know, sort of in the moment, I'm sort of focused in on what's happening. Um, I, you know, I went to, went, I had a couple close calls when I was in Afghanistan and when I got back, uh, even though I was working for the Chicago Tribune, I was based in D.C., but they, the Tribune flew me to Chicago, you know, just to sort of like decompress me, I think, more than anything. And they had me do like an interview with uh, WBEZ, I think it is, in Chicago, the public radio station. And it, like it all kind of came out during that interview, and it was like, okay, I'm done. You know, that was my psychologist for 30 minutes is telling us, reporter what happened. Uh, and then it was about like six months later that I think I was home alone and I had never seen, or maybe it had just come out, I can't remember, I had never seen Black Hawk Down. And I was watching that movie and that night was not a good night because I had like a lot of crazy, uh, crazy dreams that night. It, it, the similarities weren't exactly the same, but there were some where like, um, you know, oh shit, I'm gonna die, you know. Um, and, it, and, and to watch that film, it just kind of brought back everything that had happened in Afghanistan. Um, you know, but. And then in terms of Newtown, uh, you, anybody that saw me talk in 2017 or early 2018, I couldn't get through the Newtown section without crying. Uh, and I think now, you know, I don't think I really cried today, but you know, that still affects me. The, the it, it, I, when Evaldi happened, you know, I was just like, oh my God, it's happening all over again. Um, and it, it's helpful that I keep in touch with the Wheelers, the pictures I showed, keep in touch with them and with uh, Nicole uh, Hockley, um, you know, mostly by email and stuff. Um, That's not really a good answer. No, that's a great answer. All right, let's do a question from the audience again. All right. Anybody in the balcony? You guys are... Go ahead. What are you most proud of in your photography career? And what are you most looking forward to? What am I most proud of and what am I most look for, looking forward to? Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, going someplace warm for a little while during the winter. <laughs> and... What, I, what I'm most proud of is 
Um, you know, it's funny, I think the, the, the best body of work that I did was, uh, you know, during the Obama administration. But also, you know, I, I, I'm proud of the work I did in Afghanistan, and I'm proud of the, the coverage I did of the Reagan funeral, which went over four days. Um, so in terms of that, and now I'm proud of being a, a grandfather. Uh, it brings me a lot of joy. We're proud that you're a Madisonian. <laughs> All right, I have a question. Uh, part of this is my question, and part is from a student who sent me a message on Instagram. You once said, make authentic photographs. Think mood, emotion, and context. Be ready for the fleeting moments, both big and small. <coughs> I'm sure most photojournalists in the room agree that those words perfectly sum up our process. What other advice do you have for students or photographers interested in pursuing photojournalism? Well, you know, I think one, <laughs> I get some emails from people that, from young know, photographers, and they go, I want to be the, the next White House photographer. What do I, you know, and it's like, Dude, like, I got so lucky, you know. I mean, I just happened to be walk, working for the Chicago Tribune when Barack Obama was elected to the Senate, you know. It, it, I mean, that was the start of it. That's, you, you, can't, you, can't, you can't predict that or you can't teach somebody that. That's just luck. So I'd say you got to be ready for the luck and and follow through and and just go go after that little opening that you've been given um i i, I heard a interview with a um author uh and they asked him kind of the same question right and he said uh i tell young writers write one page every day and so let's 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 correlate that with photography and i would say You've got to go out and make pictures every day. You can't like do it the way I do it now, which is like you know once every week and a half or something like that. You know, to well, I, I think one of the things that one of the reasons I became pretty good during the Obama administration is because I was doing it every day. There's like you get it's not like riding a bike. You know, you can ri not ride a bike for three months and you can jump on and ride the bike just the same way you did three months ago. It's not like that with photography because there's timing and anticipation and you know you just gotta you gotta be in the groove all the time, right? Um, so I think you gotta make pictures every day and just be relentless. And uh, Cartier-Bresson, the famous French photographer, once said that his worst pictures were his first ten thousand pictures. I think there's something to be said for that. Okay, audience. Go ahead. What would be your next project? What would be uh, well, my next project or next book? So, I mean, it's, I've got a pretty good archive. I mean, I don't just mean of the Obama years, but just like throughout my career of, you know, pe people aren't really that familiar with the pictures. I showed a few of them, but not many tonight. And there's this line from a Lumineers song that's been, um, just, it's been uh, in my head since I first heard it. It's from their new album, Bright Side, and there's a song called AM, a AM Radio. And uh, Wes Schultz, the lead singer, was nice enough to send me an MP3 before it came out. And I'm driving in the car listening to this song for the first time, AM Radio, and there's a line that goes, if the, if the photograph doesn't bring you back, and I interpreted that to mean that, for me, a photograph, I can tell you everything that happened surrounding the making of that photograph, what was happening. People are always surprised at my uh, memory, which I don't think is that good. But when it's a photograph, and I write about it on Instagram, I can remember all those details. I don't, I don't have notes anywhere, I just remember, and that line struck me that way. So I'm trying to like think if there's a book related to that line. Come on, someone else? Yeah, right. Right. If you're 
asking. Yeah, she's asking if if um, if if the uh, if Shayla Craighead, uh, TFG's photographer, the former guy. Um, <laughs> I think that's what Biden calls him. Uh, is going to expose something that happened. I don't know. I mean, if she didn't have access, then probably not. I mean, she did testify before the January 6th committee, and there were a couple of clips that were played on TV. And as I have said to, I think, my wife and other friends, um, um, they, one of the congressmen said that um, there are no photographs that exist of Trump in the dining room um, when he was in there watching TV for hours, that the White House photographer testified under subpoena that um, she was told she couldn't take any photographs. And the question that I have is who told her that? Like, it'd be one thing if Trump told her that, because, you know, President Obama could tell me, I don't want you in here. That's his prerogative. There's no rule or law. But if it was a staff person that said that to her, that's a problem, I think. Yeah, so she's asking about the, the words and the rhetoric uh, from President Obama and how it related to the visuals. Okay, I'm going to tell you guys about a really cool event that you all got to go to, and it's free. So on October 16th, over here at the library, Cody Keenan, who was President Obama's chief speechwriter, uh, just is publishing a book. It comes out next week. So I'm doing an event with him to try to, you know, help his book out. Um, and he focused on 10 days in 2015 where all kinds of shit happened in that 10-day period. And he was right in the middle of it. You know, this is when Charleston bombing happened, when, uh, ch uh, not bombing, Charleston shooting happened, uh, Supreme Court upheld same-sex marriage, Affordable Care Act was upheld. Something happened with Putin that I don't even remember. There was like all kinds of stuff happened. And he's gonna talk just about this. I mean, mostly about the, the crafting of speeches and how he worked with Barack Obama on his speeches, which was, you know, Barack Obama really was the chief speechwriter. Um, and I mean, I think that he was, he, he focused so much on the words and what he was gonna say on the big moments. Right, um, as that picture I showed of him with the draft of the healthcare speech. I mean, that's the way he went about his business on any major speech. Oftentimes, he would throw away the draft that the speechwriter would do and just write, hand write out his his speech. I mean, I saw him do that several times. Um, and then, in terms of the visuals, I don't, I don't think it was like. Uh, <laughs> It was like he gave me access. And he's a very photogenic guy. And um, uh, I, I don't think he thought much about it other than let's be transparent and show people what's happening behind the scenes. And he trusted me you know, to, to be there and not to be leaking things to the press or anything like that. Um, I don't know that he gave that much thought to the visuals in the moment. Can you Yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean, I think that it's important um, for for us to uh, have a good human being as president. Um, you know, uh, Joe Biden gets a lot of, you know, uh, bad press, if you will, 
Joe Biden is a, really, is a good human being. You know, he really is. I, 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 um, is he the most eloquent guy in the world? No, he's not. Is, is he, you know, is he a, a, an orator like Barack Obama? No. But he's a good human being. You know, I, I, I know that for a fact. And so I think that's, that's, that's first and foremost, is we gotta have that kind of a person, uh, you know, in, in our seats of power. And let's face it, the guy that was the last president was not a good human being. He's not, he, you know, he's, well, I, I better not say anything, because Ruthie's recording this, so. I can see this on, you know, the front page of the Cap Times. <laughs> <laughs> what are the differences between Reagan and Obama and the similarities of attitudes? Hang on one second. One second. I'll go to you next. This guy just asked a question. What is the differences between Obama and Reagan and the similarities? Between differences between Reagan and Obama and similarities. Similarities is they both had an even keel disposition. Which I you know, I think is actually a pretty good disposition to have as president. You know. Um I mean, you know, uh, you know, Clinton did a good job, and he blew up at people all the time. So maybe that's not true, but I, th I think it's probably a good characteristic to have. Uh, differences, it's like night and day. I mean, Reagan was, you know, much older, old-fashioned, um, just uh, was was very formal uh, in in kind of everything that he did. Uh, he had one friend, real true friend, which was his wife. Whereas Barack Obama must have, you know, a million friends, it seems like to me. He knows everybody. And he's much more uh, like a... Uh, it was always hard to, to get under Reagan's skin in terms of figuring out, you know, what motivated him. Where President Obama is pretty open about... He's just like a, no, a normal guy. You can have a conversation with him about anything. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I know, Presidential photography, what? <laughs> he wants to know if uh, if she asked you to be the photographer with, with that, would you say yes or would, would what was it? Would you influence? It's hard, sorry, it's hard to hear. Oh, if you offered, would it influence her to run for president? <laughs> oh yeah, I, I can make it happen. <laughs> hey Michelle, you, you have to run for, for president so I can be White House photographer again. No, look, A, Michelle is never going to run for office. There, it will never happen. It just won't happen. Uh, two, I am not going to do that job again. It just, it, it takes too much out of you. Um, I had no life for eight years, no personal life, very little personal life. I think I missed like every birthday, every anniversary, you know. Um, but don't even think that Michelle might run. She's not going to run. It's just not going to happen. I'll give you a thousand dollars if she runs. Just you, not everybody. <laughs> Well, you know, I'll probably be like 90 then, you know. <laughs> somebody asked me if I would like photograph like Malia's wedding. And I was like, I think Malia is going to get somebody a little more hip than me for her <laughs> wedding. I did, you know, uh, one story will, is that when Malia graduated from high school, uh, he was still president. Um, and so Malia has like all these great pictures of her high school graduation. I guess I'm patting myself on the back there. Uh, and then, well, Sasha didn't graduate until after he left office. And so I went in to see him one day at his office, and I said, uh, this is his, after he's left the White House. So his D.C. office. I went in to see him in D.C. office, and I said to him, I said, sir, uh, uh, I've, I've made arrangements with uh, Michelle's chief of staff. I'm going to photograph Sasha's high school graduation. I'm volunteering to do it, 
you don't have to pay me. Because if I don't do it, then you're just going to have a bunch of shitty iPhone pictures that you take. Have you been consulted in any way for the photos that will be in the Obama Presidential Library? Oh yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, um, yeah, I had very tense words with them. <laughs> their, their first edit. But no, so yeah, I'm involved um, uh, as an as a un, un paid, I guess you call it, consultant. Uh, matter of fact, I just, this morning, I guess it was this morning, uh, I'm doing this event in Chicago in, I don't remember when it is, a couple weeks. And so um, they're going to show me the latest like exhibits and stuff, proposed exhibits with, with photos um, while I'm there. So. Right. He's, he's asking, did the advance in technology make my job easier? I mean, I think that the, the process of making the pictures is still the same, right? It doesn't matter if it's in film or digital. I think it was, it, it was easier in digital in the sense that uh, you didn't have to carry, you know, 30 rolls of film with you on a, you know, a foreign trip day. You know, you could just carry, you know, four cards, digital cards. Um, I think the challenge with digital is storage. You know, uh, funny. I'll tell you a funny story. Is um, I, I don't. I'm not really that tech savvy. But you know, we had some ser We had a server where all the pictures, you know, would be uploaded to the server, as well as like all the emails and. Uh, all his emails and all our staff emails. It was all in one big server somewhere. I don't even know where the heck it was. And uh, so we're in Mars's Vineyard on vacation. He's playing golf. And they get word that uh, there's been an earthquake in DC. And the military aide who was like, for whatever reason, was, oh, embassy buildings have fallen down. It's like a really big deal, which was not true. But like we didn't know, and we're like, holy shit. So everybody who's on the golf course, Secret Service guys and staff, they're calling. I don't know if I've told my wife this story. They're, call <laughs> they're calling their families, everything okay, everything okay? And I call our tech guy and I go, is the server okay? <laughs> you know, and it, it actually, uh, it made, the, the, I don't know how this all this stuff works, if it's the archives or the White House, but they, 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 th that caused them to have a backup server someplace else, you know. Anybody in the balcony? Can't really see. Pete, I'll hit you with a question real quick over here. Yeah. Um, how are we doing? I mean, look, it, <coughs> as I said at the beginning, I, had a, I got a D in history, you know. I, I wasn't joking. No, I think that the, um, I guess I'm trying to, um, one of the, there's, there's going to be, long after I'm gone, there are probably going to be pe people that will do um, photo books on my photos, right? Uh, and they, they might choose different photos. And I wanted to tell my story. It, it, you know, while I'm still around. And I think it's important just to hear things from my perspective in terms of just choosing which images to put in the book. I mean, you know, Obama and its mid-portrait, there's, I think, 350 pictures. I, you know, that's out of 1.9 million. So I had to make uh, subjective decisions on what pictures I think belonged in that book because I wanted, I wanted it to be my look at the presidency. Not his look, you know, the Obama pres Presidential Library or Foundation or whatever, they'll probably do a coffee table book and it's gonna look a lot different than mine because it's not as personal as mine. You know, it's, it's like their vision of what they wanna show and mine is much more personal about what I thought was important, photographs that I important. 
And yet, all the pictures, every single one of them, are not in some folder in, you know, the basement of my, you know, office or scattered in, you know, sh I'm not showing them to, you know, uh, Russians and stuff like that. Like, every single picture is at the National Archives, even the ones that are out of focus. So, like, if you are one of the ones that uh, do a photo book in, in a, you know, in 10 years when I'm not around or, well, hopefully I'll be around in 10 years, <laughs> 30 years when I'm not around, don't pick the ones that are out of focus. Like, leave, just leave those out. But they're there. What did you wear? See, what did I wear? I wore a suit. I don't wear suits anymore. I had to wear a suit to the uh, portrait unveiling, and it had like uh, bug holes in it, I, I discovered, because it had been sitting in my closet for four years. My wife made me throw it out when I got home. True story. Steve, hey, was there, were there any moments that you really wanted to photograph, but uh, the president said no? no Not really. He's asked if there are any photographs that I wanted to photograph that the president said no. Not, none that come to mind. I think that there, the, as I mentioned, uh, on uh, overseas trips, my, th there were moments I didn't photograph because I wasn't there. Like, I wasn't allowed to be in the room. So who knows what I m might have missed. I mean, I know he had s some uh, 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 sort of unscheduled meeting with Putin one time in Russia. And, you know, they just, like, wouldn't let me in. So there's nothing I can do about that. But no, I don't think there's, I mean, I, I think that I used a pretty good intuitive sense on like, if he had a one-on-one -on -one meeting, you know, I wouldn't stay in there the whole time. You know, he'd give him his space. Um, just common sense more than anything. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I like that, that's smart, waving your phone. Go ahead. I didn't hear the last part. Did I capture what? Did she capture, or did you capture in the photos yourself? Is that what you're asking, Ilana? Yeah. yeah. Can you come down so we can hear you? It's one of our freelance photographers, Ilana Barav. Welcome. Here, come here, come here, come here. I didn't get any of that. Where do I win? <laughs> Spin the wheel? Okay. I said, did you, well, I have a lot of questions. The first question, I'll pause. The second question was, did you write all of the captions for the photos that are filed that you said were in the archives? And then, well, I guess that's the biggest question. Did you caption all of those photos? And how? And what? And how. And how. Yeah. So, uh, one of the things that I did, is, so, okay, let's go back. In um, Bush's second term, Bush 43's second term, the White House photographer, Eric Draper, made the switch from film to digital. So he set up the basic system, right? When I came in, that was like, you know, he just kind of passed the baton in terms of the way we do it, and I tried to improve upon it. I didn't like throw it out. I said, okay, we're gonna do AP style captions. Anybody that knows AP style caption means who, what, where, when, why, you know, that kind of stuff. And um, we always used his first, like people were so irritated with me on staff because I said, every caption is gonna go President Barack Obama. And they go, why, why can't you just say President Obama? And I was like, well, what if someday, you know, Michelle's president or Malia's president? Then the archives, it's going to be hard to like track down which, which it is. I said, so we're going to do full names, you know, dates, places, and then try to keep everybody that's in the picture, try to like identify them in the picture. So not only am I proud of the 
um, the pictures that are in the archive, but every picture has that kind of information attached to it. So imagine how valuable that'll be for researchers in future years. Did I write the captions? Thankfully, no. <laughs> so we had a photo archivist whose job it was to do that. Did I write all the captions for my books? Yes, I did. Because oftentimes they were different than an AP style, style caption. It was more personal. You know, if you read this book, uh, the captions are much more, many of them are much more personal rather than like, here's the facts. Um, so, uh, so hopefully that answers your question. But no, seriously, so like, and, and the photo archivist who had actually been there since the Reagan days, same person, she left day two of Trump. She quit. Um, uh, she also did like keywords, you know, so like if you wanted to see, she had one keyword was, uh, was uh, um, President Alone Oval or I, I don't know how she actually did it. So you could, you know, somebody could go in, researcher could go in and search uh, those, key, those kind of keywords and find every picture that exists of Barack Obama by himself in the Oval Office. You know, which is like invaluable uh, information for researchers and, and, and years to come. And for throwing shade. If needed. Yeah. So I, I don't know about you, I'm, I'm getting a little uh, worn out here. Uh, I'm sure you are too. Stop out. Two more questions. Uh, i tell you about Mandela Barnes. Um, so I, uh, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you the story. I don't know, I don't think he's here, but uh, I'll tell you a story. He like, uh, I, I got a call on my cell phone uh, a while ago, like a few months ago. And um, I didn't recognize the number, so I didn't answer it. You know, I just don't answer my phone. Uh, and then I saw the person left an email, uh, voicemail, and I looked at the transcription. I didn't listen to it, I just looked at the transcription. And it was like, this is Mandela Barnes, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, this is like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of those calls you get, right? You want some money. Uh, and he's like, and, I, and I'm reading it, and it goes, is this Pete Souza? I'd like to have coffee with you sometime. And I'm like, what? So I, 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 I hit the dial, I, I dialed the number back, and I hear, this is Mandela, and I'm like, get out of here. Like, <laughs> so, um, so I had coffee with him, and I said, uh, I said I'd really like to uh, you know, spend a day with you sometime on, on the campaign trail. And so we set a day, uh, like it was two weeks forward, uh, I was like, that works for me, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, the, his staff person picked me up at like 8.30 or something in the morning, uh, except the night before, she calls me and she goes, uh, there's been a change. I go, whatever, you know, you can do it another time. She goes, no, 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 no. the schedule t for tomorrow has changed completely. I go, whatever, I don't, you know, I don't, you know, that's fine. She goes, Alex Lasry is going to drop out. And I was like, get out of here. She goes, yeah, he's dropping out tomorrow. And so that was the first event we did, was with Alex Lasry at, at the, the uh, whatever the Bucks, whatever it's called. And then of course the next couple of days, the other two dropped out. So like they, now they think I'm like some kind of lucky charm or something. <laughs> no, but he seems, you know, he seems like a down to earth guy. Uh, I like them, uh, I, I mean, he's, <laughs> Look, we need to, we've, both my wife and I turn in our absentee ballot today. Whether you agree with me or not, it is your civic duty to vote. If, and look, there's, a, you know, there's, an, a, there's several important initiatives on our ballot, you know, including one about repealing that crazy 1841, whatever it is, abortion uh, ruling. So you've you got, you got to get out and vote. Don't. There's no excuse. All right, one more question. Oh, like all these people. Um, I'm really nervous to ask you this. You say that you... Ruthie's were... nervous, too, and she I'm did fine. I'm good now. <laughs> you, you, you say you remember every photo you take, right? Yeah. Can I bring up a photo? Yeah. Ooh, she's got a photo to oh, bring up to ask hard. if he remembers it's it. Natasha. Oh! I'm trying to get a photo. Oh, my gosh. Where's my camera? <laughs> Oh, 
Okay. So this is uh, uh, so in uh, 1982 or three. Two. Two. Yeah. So in 1982, um, what was happening in Chicago and really around the country is some of the young people have no idea what I'm talking about. You were very young. Uh, there was a Tylenol scare. Do you remember this? And I was working for the Chicago Sun Times in Chicago, and one, you, you have no idea what was going on in Chicago in terms of everybody was scared shitless because people were dying from taking Tylenol, and we didn't know what was going on. And um, I covered a funeral of uh, the Janus family, where three members of the family had died. This is my picture of the funeral with Colonel Bernadine and the three caskets at the front of the church, and he's kissing the casket. Um, that was her family. You were three? Four. She was four at the time. Um, and it's this coming, I don't remember the date. I will be on Thursday, September 29th. September 29th will be the 40th anniversary of that. And she's been trying to find out you know, what, everything that kind of happened, because she was so young at the time. Um, and so she and I have communicated a couple times via email. Yeah. Um, and so I, I definitely remember this photograph. And I remember the feeling of the city uh, during that time, um, because it was crazy, you know, that people were dying from taking Tylenol, uh, and nobody knew what had happened. And it, you know, and to this day, no one has been arrested. Well, somebody may have been arrested, but nobody has been convicted uh, of what happened. And now the reason why you have those crazy, you know, tops on your Tylenol and all your over-the-counter medication is because what had happened to her family. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I still have some flexibility to get there. <laughs> okay, do you have one last question? I do, you have okay. my last question. Okay, we'll, we'll lighten it up a little bit here. Um, Pete and I have a shared passion for music and concert photography, oh. so my burning question is, uh, what are your top five most influential albums of your life? Well, you know... He's got them written out. I'm such a big music <laughs> fan that I'm always writing down albums and stuff, and it... it, it I'll have to tell you that um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a creature of uh, 1970, 71. Um, but I think when I was, uh, I was young when the Beatles first uh, uh, came to the U.S. I remember my aunt Jessie calling me, watch the Beatles, you gotta watch the Beatles, they're gonna be on Ed Sullivan. I had no idea what she was talking about. And so it's hard to pick any one Beatles album, but I think Rubber Soul is, 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 is a classic one in Abbey Road, Let It Be. And then when I was in uh, high school, um, anybody remember 8-Tracks? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I had like, uh, I think I had like 8 eight track tapes for my uh, Volts, 1962 Volkswagen or whatever it was. And two of the ones that I used to listen to all the time was uh, Joe Cocker, Mad Dogs and Englishmen, uh, and uh, Sly and the Family Stone, Greatest Hits. And then when I had a, uh, I also when I was in high school, I had a, a record player, that's what we called them. We, we didn't call it a turntable, we called it a record player. The, uh, the album I probably played the most more than any was uh, uh, Cosmos Factory by Credence Clearwater Revival. Um, and then in, uh, in graduate school, it, it, I went to graduate school at Kansas State University and this uh, sports writer for the college paper said, hey, uh, you wanna go to Kansas City with me? I'm gonna try to do a review of Bruce Springsteen's concert. And I was like, who? Like, I had no idea who he was. Um, and it was the Darkness on the Edge of Town tour. Uh, and so that, that, that 
you know, I saw him in concert in, that was like in June of 1978, something like that. And, uh, um, it, you know, I just like, that was it. I was, I've now seen Bruce probably 50 times or 40 times. And then the, the, the Dylan album that I like more than the classic ones that other people would say was, is this album called Oh Mercy. Which is, I think, just a great album. It's got this song "Political World" on it. Man with a long black coat. It's just like it's like it's, it's a, so that had a lot of influence on me. And then more recently, uh, two albums that uh, by musical artists that I'm now friends with, the Lumineers. Um, I still like their first album, and and their latest one, "Bright Side," the best. Uh, I did I. I I'm not one of these guys that watches MTV, and so I would listen to the Lumineers' first album all the time, but I had no idea what they looked like. You know, I had no idea. And then they came to the White House, and like, uh, you know, and then I was like, they surprised me just the way they looked. I, I was like, oh, I didn't know you had long hair and a beard and wore a hat and all that kind of stuff. And you know, now I'm friends with those guys. And then Brandy Carlisle, uh, who. Patty and I met in, I can't remember if it was 05 or 06, she opened for Sean Colvin at the Birchmere. Uh, her first album had just come out. And we met her briefly, you know, after her set. She signed a couple CDs for us. Uh, and then the following year, The Story came out. And that just blew me away. And so I think her album, The Story. I should say, the, the album, <laughs> that's more influ influential of hers is, uh, by the way, I forgive you. Because I actually am credited with group vocals on one of the songs. <laughs> I, was, I was photographing her in the studio, and, and it's, it's the song, Hold Out Your Hand, for those of you that, where you go, ba-da-da, da-da-da, ba-da-da. And so she had, like, anybody that was in the studio came and sang along, so. <laughs> I've now sung, uh, uh, sung that song, at the backup vocals, at Red Rocks, the Beacon Theater in uh, New York, and the Gorge in Washington, uh, outside of Seattle. So she expects me to come on stage anytime. I'm there when they play that song. Uh, thank you for hanging in there. Um, my goal was to get you out of here by nine o'clock. It's 8.57.